Greeting students, this is the 10th lecture of the certification course on law of contracts in which we are going to continue with the idea of legality of object as mentioned under Indian Contract Act of 1872. So let's begin. As you can see on the screen right now, void agreements. Given the meaning of a void agreement, the Act says in section 2G that an agreement not enforceable by law is said to be void. So the following types of agreements are declared to be void. Number one, agreements of which consideration and objects are unlawful in part. Number two, agreements without consideration. Number three, agreements in restraint of marriage. Number four, agreements in restraint of trade. Number five, agreements in restraint of legal proceedings. Number six, unmeaning agreements or uncertain agreements. Number seven, wagering agreements number eight agreements to do impossible acts now except the last kind which will be discussed in the lecture on discharge of contract we will be discussing all the kinds in this and the next lecture so starting with section 24 itself which says that agreements in which a part of consideration or object is unlawful so the section 24 it goes like agreements void if considerations and objects unlawful in part if any part of a single consideration for one or more objects or any one or any part of any one of several considerations for a single object is unlawful, the agreement is void. So it has an illustration which says that A promises to superintend on behalf of B a legal manufacturer of indigo and an illegal traffic in other articles. B, promise, B promises to pay A a salary of Rs 10,000 a year. The agreement here is void because the object of A's promise and the consideration for S's promise being in part unlawful. The working philosophy behind the provision was stated by Justice Willis in a case of Pickering v. Ilfracom Railway Co. where you cannot sever the illegal from the legal part of a covenant, the contract is altogether void. But where you can sever them, whether the illegality be created by statute or by common law, you may reject the bad part and retain the good. So this section comes into play when a part of the consideration for an object or more than one object of an agreement is unlawful. The whole of the agreement so would be void unless unlawful portion can be severed without damaging the lawful portion. In Alice Mary Hill versus William Clark, a person promised to pay a fixed sum of money on monthly basis to a married woman for living in adultery with the promiser, which is unlawful, and for keeping his house, which is lawful. So the whole agreement was held to be void because it was impossible here to apportion the single lump sum between the lawful object and the unlawful one. As seen in Uno BB versus Fias Bosch, where the legal part of an agreement is se was severable from the illegal, the former was held to be enforced. And here, a Muslim husband agreed by a registered deed was to hand over to his wife the totality of his earnings and not to do anything without her permission and if he did so, she would be at liberty to divorce him. So the latter part of the agreement was obviously unlawful and it was severed from that part under which he promised to hand over all earnings and this part was enforced giving it this meaning that he was bound to give only maintenance amount and not every bit that he might earn. So that takes us to uh, section 25 that is agreements without consideration now section 25 declares that an agreement without consideration is void and this is of course subject to some exceptions which we have already discussed uh, under the lecture lecture 4 of the certification course which was on consideration so moving on the next important section that we are going to discuss is that of restraint of marriage it is a short discussion because it is not as important as the coming sections Still, we are going to discuss it. it the section 26 it says, Agreement in restraint of marriage are void. Every agreement in restraint of the marriage of any person other than a minor is void. So it is the policy of law to discourage agreements which restrain ma freedom of marriage. The restraint may be general or partial, that is to say, the party may be restrained from marrying at all or from marrying for a fixed period or from marrying a particular person or a class of persons, the agreement is void. The only exception here is in favor of a minor. However, a penalty upon remarriage may not be construed as a restraint of marriage. Thus, in Rao Rani vs Gulab Rani, 
an agreement between two co-widows that if any of them remarried, she should forfeit her right to her share in the deceased husband's property has been upheld. The court pointing out that no restraint was imposed upon either of the two widows for remarriage. All that was provided was that if a widow, re- with, if a widow elected to remarry, she would be deprived of her rights. Similarly, in Lata Fatnu Nisha vs. Shahara Banu Begum, an agreement that upon remarriage the, vid- the widow would lose her the right to maintenance and in Badu Badan Nisha, an agreement that upon the husband marrying a second wife, the first would get the right to divorce him, have been upheld. Now, moving on to a much more important and thorough section, that is restraint of trade. Section 27 says that agreement and restraint of trade void. Every agreement by which one is restrained from ex- exercising a lawful profession, trade or business of any kind is to that extent void. And there is an exception attached to this section which says that saving of agreement not to carry on business of which goodwill is sold. One who sells the goodwill of a business may agree with the buyer to refrain from carrying on a similar business within specified local limits so long as the buyer or any person deriving title to the goodwill from him carries on a like business therein, provided that such limits appear to the court reasonable regard being had to the nature of the business. Now a question was asked in the UPPC's examination of 2012 which said, an agreement in restraint of trade under section 27 of ICA in 2022 is void. So you can see that very direct questions are asked if you have even went through the bare act you would be able to answer it. Now. Since we are talking about this section, we should start from the very protection of freedom of trade and commerce. So on that note, it has been held in the case of Leather Cloth Co. vs. Lawson that freedom of trade and commerce is a right protected by the constitution of India. Just as the legislature cannot take away individual freedom of trade, so also the individual cannot barter it away by agreement. The principle of law is this. Public policy requires that every man shall be at liberty to work for himself as shall not be at liberty to deprive himself or the state of his labor, skill or talent by any contract that he enters into. So all restraints are covered with a partial or general. That is one important idea mentioned in this section. And on that note, we have a case law of Madhu Chandra vs. Rajkumar which is going to make us understand it better. So in this case, the plaintiff and the defendant were rival shopkeepers in a locality in Calcutta. The defendant agreed to pay a sum of money to the plaintiff if he would close his business in that locality. The plaintiff accordingly did so, but the defendant refused to pay. The plaintiff sued him for the money contending that the restraint in question was only partial as he was restrained from exercising his profession only in one locality and that such restraints had been upheld in English law. So to that, Justice Couch held the agreement to be void and laid down that the words restrain from exercising a lawful profession, trade or business do not mean an absolute restriction and are intended to apply a particular restriction, a restriction limited to some place. The learned judge drew support from the use of the word absolutely in section 28 which which deals with the restraint of legal proceedings. As this word is absent from section 27, therefore he concluded that it was intended to prevent not merely a total restraint but also a partial restraint. This interpretation of this section has been generally accepted. The section has abolished the distinction between partial and total restraints of trade. Whether the restraint is general or partial, unqualified or qualified, if the agreement is in the nature of a restraint of trade, it is void. So, we notice the developments in English law, whereby in England the law relating to restraint of trade was elaborately considered by the House of Lords in the case of Nordenfeld vs. Maxim Nordenfeld Guns and Ammunition Co. The facts of this case were such that it involved a sale of goodwill by an inventor and a manufacturer of guns and ammunition who agreed with the buyer company not to practice the same trade for 25 years and not to engage in any business competing or liable to compete in any way with the business for the time being carried on by the company. He afterwards entered into an agreement with another manufacturer manufacturer of guns and ammunition and the company brought in action to restrain him. Here it was held that the first part of the agreement was valid being reasonably necessary for the protection of the purchaser's interest. But the rest of the covenant by which the by which he was prohibited from competing with the company in any business that the company might carry on 
was held as unreasonable and therefore void. Lord McNaughton laid down, The public have an interest in every person's carrying on his trade freely. So has the individual. All interference with individual liberty of action in trading and all restraints of trade of themselves, if there is nothing more, are contrary to public policy and therefore void. This is the general rule. But there are exceptions. The restraint of trade may be justified by the special circumstances of a particular case. The only justification is that the restriction should be reasonable. Reasonable in reference to the interest of the parties and reasonable in reference to the public interest. The restrictions should be so framed and guarded as to afford adequate protection to the party in whose favour it is imposed, while at the same time it is in no way injurious to the public. So the general principle in India and England is the same, that both in England and India all the restraints of trade, whether partial or total, are void. As held in S.K. Kalu vs. Ramsar and Bhagat, the only difference is that in England a restriction will be valid if it is reasonable, but in India it will be valid if it falls within any of the statutory or judicially created exceptions. To the extent to which these exceptions are an embodiment of the situations in which restraints have been found reasonable in Eng England, the two laws are identical and not widely dissimilar. So, talking about the aspect which says profession, trade or business in the given section. In the case of Revashankar Sham vs. Velji Jagjeevan Kama, the High Court of Kutch regarded an agreement to monopolize the privilege of performing religious services in a village as being opposed to public policy and hence avoid under section 27, though it may be doubted whether the words profession, trade or business as used in the section were actually intended to cover the religious services of a priest. On the other hand, the Allahabad High Court in Pothiram vs. Islam Fatima upheld as valid a restrictive covenant on the ground that the activity restrained was not in the nature of profession, trade or business. Here, Two landlords in the same neighbourhood, in order to avoid competition, agreed that a market for sale of cattle shall not be held on the same day on the lands of both of them. The High Court said that it seems to us that a landlord who is who in return for tolls or fees allows a cattle market to be conducted on his land is not thereby exercising trade or business of selling cattle. He is only a landholder and in agreement on his part not to use the land on a certain day for a certain purpose does not amount to restraint of profession, trade or business. So the strange contrast in these two cases is that while letting out land for commercial purposes is not a profession, trade or business, the performance of religious services is. So the exceptions to this given section are a lot. There are a lot of exceptions. Firstly, we are going to discuss the statutory exceptions and then the judicial pronouncements on. So, under statutory exceptions, we notice there is the exception of sale of goodwill. So what it actually means is that one who sells the goodwill of a business may agree with the buyer to refrain from carrying on a similar business within specified local limits so long as the buyer or any person who deriving title to the goodwill from him carries on a like business therein, provided that such limits appear to the court reasonable regard being hard to the nature of the business. So this is what the uh, exception is provided in the given section. So apparently the object is to protect the interest of a purchaser of goodwill. As observed by Lord McNaughton in and the case of Anne Trigo vs. George Stratford Hunt, it is difficult to imagine that when the goodwill and trade of a retail shop were sold, the vendor might the next day set up a shop within a few doors and draw off all customers. Therefore, some restriction on the liberty of the seller becomes necessary. Further, in the case of D.W. Ostaloni vs. Charles Bell, it was held that the restriction is the only means by which a saleable value is given to the goodwill of a business. Far from being adverse to a public interest, the restriction by giving a real marketable value to the goodwill of a business operates as an additional inducement to individuals to employ their skills and capital in trade and thus tend to the advantage of public interest. So, where the aim of an agreement is prevention of competition, it will be void even if its nakedness is concealed behind the imposing facade of a sale of goodwill.
An attempt of this kind was evidenced in the case of Vancouver Malt and Sake Brewing Co. Limited versus Vancouver Breweries Limited. Here, the fact was says that a company was licensed to manufacture liquor and beer, but it confined its business to produce only Sake, a Japanese liquor made from rice. Its only customer was the government. It entered into an agreement with another wine and beer manufacturing company by which it sold its business and goodwill of manufacturing wine and beer, but not the right to produce sake. The agreement was held to be devoid of any content. The only business in which it was engaged was the brewing of sake, and the goodwill of its license so far as relating to sake was expressly excluded from sale. It had no goodwill to sell so far as regards of as regards the brewing of beer. Nothing had been sold. It was simply a case of the appellant undertaking to the respondent in consideration of a sum of money that it will not for 15 years carry on a particular branch of business. If there was any sale, it was a sale by the appellant of its liberty to brew beer and a purchase by the respondent of protection against the possible competition of the appellant in the brewing of the beer. So, since we are talking about this, we must come to what are the limits of restraint. So we notice that an agreement has to specify the local limits of the restraint. The seller can be restrained within certain territorial or geographical limits and the limits must be reasonable. The reasonableness of restrictions will depend upon many factors. For example, as seen in the case of Damodar Lakshmati Lele vs Kashinath Vaman Lele, the area in which the goodwill is effectively enjoyed and the price paid for it is one such example. The seller can only be restrained from carrying on a similar, similar business and also only for such period for which the business sold is actually carried on either by the buyer or by any person deriving title to the goodwill from him. So the second statutory exception that we notice here in terms of section 27 is the Partnership Act. Yes, the, there are three sections in the Partnership Act which validate agreements in restraint of trade. For example, section 11, it enables partners during the continuance of the firm to restrict their mutual liberty by agreeing that none of them shall carry on any business other than that of the firm. Then there is section 36, which enables them to restrain any outgoing partner from carrying on a similar business within a specified period or within specified local limits. Such agreements shall be valid if the restrictions imposed are least reasonable. As under section 54 of the Partnership Act, a similar agreement made by partners upon or in anticipation of dissolution by which they may restrain each other from carrying on a business similar to that of the firm. So we notice that it is necessary for the validity of a restraint under section 36 or section 54 that number one, the agreement should specify the local limits or the period of restraint and number two, the restriction imposed must be reasonable. Now in the case of Hukmi Chand vs Jaipur Ice and Oil Mills, we see that an agreement by a retiring partner not to carry on similar business on the land belonging to him and adjoining the factory of the firm was held to be reasonable and binding on the persons buying the land from him. Now that we have covered the statutory exceptions, let's talk about the exceptions created by judicial interpretations. So the very first hand that we see is that, that of trade combinations. So it is now almost a universal practice for traders or manufacturers in the same line of business to carry on the trade in an organized way. And it has been held in municipal committee, Khurai versus Foam, Khal Kalu Ram Hiralal, that the primary object of such associations is to regulate business and not to restrain it. Combinations of this kind are often desirable in the interest of trade itself and also for the promotion of public interest. They bring about standardized goods, fixed prices and eliminate ruminous competition. Thus, regulations as to the opening and closing of business in the market, licensing of traders, supervision and control of dealers and the mode of dealing are not illegal, even if there is an incidental deprivation of trade liberty. So an agreement between two companies that one would not employ the former employees of the other has been held to be void by reason of its generality. This was the situation in the case of Kores Manufacturing Co. Limited versus Kolog MFG Co. Limited, whereby both companies were engaged in manufacturing similar products involving technical processes in which the employees were likely to acquire knowledge of trade secrets and confidential information. 
the company is agreed that neither would employ without the written consent of the other and any person who had been the employee of the other for any time during the previous previous five years. So though the agreement was between two employers who were dealing at arm's length and on equal terms, it was held to be void. It prohibited the appointment of any person by any one company or the other who had been in the service of one or the other for any period, however short, in and in any capacity, however humble. The second exception is that of solace or exclusive dealing agreements. What does this mean? It means that in Vogue, there is another business practice that a producer or manufacturer likes to market his goods through a sole agent or distributor. And the latter agrees in turn not to deal with the goods of any other manufacturer. A producer may, for example, agree to sell all his output to one consumer who in turn agrees not to buy his requirement from any other source. But as held in the case of Hal Bilas vs. Madhya Prasad, where a manufacturer or supplier, after meeting all the requirements of a buyer, has surplus to sell to others, such surplus he has and he cannot be restrained from doing so because the buyer cannot restrain the seller from dealing with others unless he can acquire the whole stock during the period of the agreement. Further, it has been held in the case of Shell UK Limited versus Lost Stock Garages Limited that where a contract is reasonable and fair at the beginning but circumstances have arisen which show that it is being enforced by one party in a manner which is prejudicial to the interests of the other the courts will hold the agreement to be unenforceable, though not void or invalid. Now, the third restriction that there is, is that of, the third exception that is there to the section of the strength of trade is that of restraints upon employees. That is restraints upon, uh, restraints during uh, employment and then there is restraints after termination of employment. So, first we are going to see restraints during employment. And for that we are going to see the authority of Herbert Morris Limited versus Saxel B, whereby agreements of service, it was held that agreements of service often contain negative covenants preventing the employee from working elsewhere during the period covered by the agreement. Trade secrets, the names of customers are denominated as objective knowledge. These may not be given away by a servant, they are his master's property and there is no role of public interest which prevents a transfer of them against the master's will being restrained. Further, in another case of Charlesworth versus McDonald. A agreed to become assistant for three years to B, who was a physician and surgeon practicing at Zanzibar. The appointment was subject to the clause against practicing. A left the service within a year and began to practice there on his own account. But he was restrained from doing so during the period of three years. Here, Chief Justice Farron explained the principle thus. An agreement of this class does not fall within Section 27. If it did, all contracts of personal service for a fixed period would be void. An agreement to serve exclusively for a week, a day or even for an hour necessarily prevents the person so agreeing to serve from exercising his calling during that period for anyone else than the person with whom he so agrees. Now talking about the restraints after termination of employment. An agreement to restrain a servant from competing with his employer after the termination of employment may not be allowed by the courts. Thus, in the case of Brahmaputra T. Co. Limited vs. East Karth, where an attempt was made to restrain a servant from competing for five years after the period of service, the court observed contracts by which persons are restrained from competing after the term of the agreement is over with their former employers within reasonable limits are well known in English law. And the omission to make any such contract an exception to the general prohibition contained in section 27 indicates that it was not intended to give them legal effect in this country. So the principles the established have been approved by the Supreme Court in Niranjan Shankar Golikari vs. Century, Century SPG and MFG Co. Limited. So here, a company manufacturing tire court yarn was offered collaboration by a foreign producer on the condition that the company shall maintain secrecy of all the technical information and that it should obtain corresponding secrecy arrangements from its employees. The defendant was, the defendant was appointed for a period of five years the condition being that during this period he shall not serve anywhere else even if the, he left the service earlier. So, in this case, Justice Shalat held the agreement to be valid and the defendant was accordingly restrained from serving anywhere else during the currency of the agreement. 
he said the evidence is clear that the appellant has torn the agreement to pieces only because he has been offered a high remuneration obviously he cannot be heard to say that no injunction should be granted against him to enforce the negative covenant which is not opposed to public policy the injunction issued against him is restricted as to time the nature of employment and as to area and thus cannot be said to be too wide or unreasonable or unnecessary for the protection of the interests of the respondent company now talking about the protection of trade secrets as observed by learned judge younger in the case of atwood and versus lamnant one of the versus lamnant one of the principles is that a master is not entitled to restrain his servant after the termination of employment from offering competition but he is entitled to reasonable protection against exploitation of trade secrets thus in the case of mason versus provident clothing and supply co limited the house of lords did not allow an employer to restrain his canvasser for a period of 3 years after the termination of his service here the court pointed out that the capacity for canvassing is a natural gift and not due to special training provided by the employer had they been content with asking him to bind himself not to canvass within the area where he had actually assisted in building up the goodwill of their business or in an area restricted to places where the knowledge which he had acquired in his employment could obviously have been used to their prejudice they might have secured a right to restrain him within these limits on the another hand on the other hand in another case in the case that is fitch versus davis the house of lords allowed a covenant by which a solicitor's clerk was restrained from practicing within 7 miles of the city it being reasonably necessary for protecting the interest of both the parties but in no case students has the court allowed covenants against competition and lastly on agreements between employers in prithvinath malta versus union of india an agreement between two employers that neither would employ any person who had been the other's employee within a period of 5 years has been held to be void as it imposed too wide and unreasonable restrictions upon freedom of employment and in the case of wipro limited versus beckman colto international sa an agreement between two employers that in cessation that on cessation of their relationship neither would induce or solicit the employees of the other to leave jobs and join pre-offered jobs and other comp- competing firms was held to be not falling within the scope of section 27 as it did not envisage any restriction on employers the employer the employees were free to move out of their jobs and join rivals and no injunction could be issued against the other party restraining it from taking in such turn away employees the court observed that if the employees can leave here and go there without solicitation how can there be an injunction when they so when they do so on solicitation and on the idea of effect of premature removal we have the authority of general bill posting co limited versus atkinson where a restriction of this kind will cease to be effective against an employee who has been prematurely removed without his fault the supreme court here also pointed out that it is staying beyond the term of service would be prima facie void and that the only ground on which it could be justified is by bringing it within the scope of the exception that is by showing that it is necessary for the protection of the employer's goodwill the court further said that even if such a restraint is valid it will only apply after the expiry of the term in its natural course and not when the employee is wrongfully dismissed earlier it could also apply if the employee left his service earlier but leaving a service is different from premature termination here the strain clause became inapplicable so students that sums up lecture 10 of the certification course as a part of which i have discussed with you section 24 section 26 and section 27 in the next lecture i will be covering section 28 section 29 and section 30 and then completing this entire chapter that legality of object is thank you till we see each other again